up to today, veterans have played a unique role within the peace and anti-war movement. Even in today's all-volunteer military, many soldiers have resisted the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. So how can people support a contemporary war resistors in the U.S. military or in the current war between the Ukraine and Russia? Now, today we have a very distinguished panel. Um, I know each and every one of these people. Um, you basically see over 50 years a generation of resistance um, by U.S. soldiers and or veterans. Um, we're going to, the panel is going to present itself in the eras, in the order of the eras. So I'm going to give you just a little bit about each person. Um, Mike Dietrich, he was drafted in the Army in 1966. He trained as an intelligence analyst and interrogator linguist. He worked out of the Combined Military Inter Interrogation Center in Chalon, Saigon. He is co-founder of the Seattle BFP chapter established in 2003 and served as its first president. Dan Gilman, down there at the end, he was drafted into the Army in 1967 and spent 1969 in Vietnam working as a medic in the Battalion Medical Clinic. He is a former president of the Seattle Chapter of Veterans for Peace and serves on the organizing committee of the Seattle Anti-War Coalition. Then we have Stephanie Atkinson. Uh, she enlisted in the Army Reserve at age 17, like me, through the delayed entry program, the same program I went into, and served for six years. She was stop lost by the Army in 1990 after the invasion of Iraq into, into Kuwait. So we're contemporaries in terms of when we serve. Um, myself, and then Joy Diamani is an Army veteran who's, who was assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division as a public affairs specialist from 2002 to 2008, deployed to Iraq twice, and has been learning, educating, and speaking out about military industrial complex, the Mike, ever since. And she has a book coming out in November um, 2022, If You Ain't Cheating, You Ain't Trying. Another lessons I learned in the Army. <laughs> I want to say one more thing. I would also like to recognize that Michael McPherson is the National Recipient of the Veterans for Peace Veteran of the Year oh. for 2022. Thank you. So why is this conference and exhibit important? Well, people would say because it's history and people should know their history. We should learn from our history so that we won't make the same mistakes and all that kind of stuff and, and to have knowledge of history, right? And that's all true. Um, but for me, the most important reason goes beyond that because you can know history, but if you don't take action, it, it really doesn't matter. If you're not taking the knowledge and using it to create change, then it doesn't matter that much. So I think it's important because active duty and veterans need to know that they are not alone if they're feeling like the wars and the things they're participating in is wrong. Role models are really important. It's important to see people who look like you who've been in similar situations as yourself, doing things so that you know it can be done. So if you feel like you're alone, you're less likely to take certain steps. But if you know that there's a history of veteran resistance, of active duty resistance, then you're more likely to take the step yourself because it's been done before and you actually have a map. And that's one of the reasons that I'm very grateful to Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Um, because they actually came home and created a map for the generations that followed. And there's a possibility, maybe there would have been, but there's a big possibility there might not have been a Veterans for Peace if there had not been a VVAW. Um, I joined VFP in late 2002 when I met David Klein at a talk about and he, he was the national president of Veterans for Peace at the time. He's no longer with us. He's a Vietnam veteran. Um, he was at a talk about civil liberties after 9-11. <clears throat> so I'm grateful to Veterans for Peace that it was there for me to be able to join. Because um, after, before the U.S. Invasion, invaded Iraq, I had already decided that, for me, peace was kind of the umbrella that I was thinking about when it comes to economic and social justice across all spectrums. 
So I was trying to get involved in a peace movement, but it wasn't the peace movement I ended up getting involved in, which I would say was more of an anti-war movement than a peace movement. But it was what I needed at the time. And if it hadn't been for Veterans for Peace, I, I don't know what I would have done. So I'm really grateful the Veterans for Peace and military family speak out because both of them were there for me when I needed them the most. And there might not, have, might not be an Iraq Veterans Against the War if there hadn't been a Veterans for Peace because Iraq Veterans Against the War was incubated, which is now about face, was really incubated in Veterans for Peace. In fact, I was at, Michael Hoffman is the original um, founding member of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Uh, he lived in Pennsylvania. He might still be there, I'm not sure. Um, but I was at a meeting, and I was like a newbie, just getting involved, uh, when they started talking about starting um, Iraq Veterans Against the War. It was David Klein, some members from the NYC chapter, and some members from the Philadelphia chapter. Um, VFP is kind of an umbrella for the different generations of, of veterans. So I'm grateful to VFP very much. So I'm going to get out of the way now and um, let the uh, panelists speak. Mike. <coughs> well, you gave me a. Yeah, Mike, here's the microphone. Oh. Where's the microphone go? You can come up here. Carly's got it. Go share. Just pass on down. Just on. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay. We have the technology. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I've already got a little short introduction to me, and, I, and uh, I'm going to break my uh, presentation down on a couple of different levels. One is the National VFP, excuse me, the National v, VVAW. And there's quite a bit of information online and, and uh, books, etc., about uh, Vietnam veterans against the war. So I'll just give a short outline about that, and then I'll introduce some books that I think would be useful. And then I will give a, um, some, a personal example or a personal story of how I got involved in the anti-war movement and to my personal experience in Vietnam, which led me to the anti-war movement. So in April 1967, six veterans marched in New York City behind a banner complaint proclaiming Vietnam vets against the war. And in November 1967, Jan Crum, one of the six vets called a meeting together to form BVAW. BVAW members went on to march in the October 68 San Francisco march with active duty GIs, which was the first time in U.S. history that an organized protest to a war by veterans and active duty GIs was conducted while the war was still raging. And this is an important point, you know, it's absolutely historic. It's never happened before. In December 1970, VVAW testified at the Citizens' Inquiry into War Crimes and later in February 1971 held three days of winter soldiers' investigations to identify U.S. atrocities as common policy and not isolated incidents. This was filmed and became the documentary Winter Soldier. Then in April-May 1971, VVAW staged Operation Dewey Canyon 3 with over a thousand vets in front of the U.S. Capitol holding guerrilla theater and throwing their medals on the Capitol steps. VVAW at its peak in 1973 had some 30,000 veteran and supporting members with 30 chapters. There's some good, uh, good books about VVAW in particular. The New Winter Soldiers, can you see that? By Richard Moser. The Strength Not to Fight by James W. Tolleson. And this is, a, this is a very good one. Soldiers in Revolt by David Courtright. So my experience in Vietnam led me directly to participate in VVAW and in ongoing my, my experience with VV, VFP. Uh, I was a soldier, as uh, Michael mentioned, uh, Company A, 519th MI Battalion, 525 MI, MI Group, and I was an interrogator linguist with the Combined Military Interrogation Center in 1968 in Cho And as some of you may know, uh, 1968 in Vietnam was a, was a horribly, catastrophically bloody war, mostly for the Vietnamese, but also for the Americans. There were 16,000 Americans that died in 1968 
uh, in Vietnam. In May, the month I was there too, 2,000 soldiers alone died in Vietnam. Our armed compound was, uh, compound was just down from Tonson Yut and uh, up from the so-called Futo racetrack. And in uh, May of 1968, there were some uh, infiltrators into the village right next to our compound. And the uh, Arvin and American uh, Air Forces and, and uh, gunships came in and literally blew this village away. Mind you, these were mostly refugees who were uh, forced out of their villages from the uh, provinces, and they had really no other place to live. But anyway, our sergeant major was on the roof filming this with another uh, soldier. Uh, we finally had to vacate the roof where we were because of the frag fragmentation bombs from the 250-pound and 500-pound bombs. But the short and long and short of the story was that uh, they blew that village away with napalm rockets, uh, white phosphorus, and bombs, <coughs> and gunship. The village people knew us. We were a, 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 a company A of a oh, hundred people or so, so they knew us. It was a sort of a neighborhood. So after these people were all killed, we estimated at least 200 people were killed. Some of them came to our compound and trying to get some sort of help. But we were not able to give them much help at all because even our medic didn't have any morphine. So we had to sort of sit put, stay put and watch these people die in front of us, including some children. That's something that uh, a visceral experience that has stayed with me <coughs> the rest of my life. When I came back to the States, I'd been back to the States for a couple of years before um, the invasion of Cambodia, and that was one of the things that I, I said to myself, how stupid can we be that we're, we're continuing to do this? I came back in late 68, and uh, then a little li bit li later from there, I, um, we had a, a Viet Vietnam Veterans Against the War house, and I was sitting in that house thinking about things, and I sort of put this horrendous village destruction behind me until I just sort of came, came came into my full consciousness and it left me crying and shaking. Uh, and it was that sort of experience that led me to get involved in what was originally at the uh, University of Washington campus, the Veterans Against Vietnam. And then, uh, and then VVAW. So locally VVAW came into existence in August of 71 as Washington VVAW with the founders members of Veterans Against the War based on the University of Washington campus. Several VA, uh, Veterans Against the War members went to D.C. to pr protest in Dewey Canyon 3, coming back and founding VVAW. One of the first actions was a guerrilla theater during stage during Seafair, simulating a search and destroy missing, mission with leaflets passed out and a bullhorn startling the citizens with the realism, realism of its action. In a first, VVA Doug marched in the 1971 annual Veterans Day parade with COs for service benefits, despite objections from the VFW and, and Legion. They decided we were veterans too. As a footnote to this, VFP 92 and other VFP chapters on the West Coast here, I think it'll be our 15th or 16th year that we are, we are marching in the Auburn annual Veterans Day parade. They tried to kick us out once, but they stopped doing that. and. Uh, we, we were marching there originally during just, uh, just after the Iraq invasion, and people uh, booed us and turned their backs on us. That's not the case now. We are welcome there with open, open arms. So Washington VVAW worked closely with GI resistance groups like the Shelter Half, Fort Lewis VVAW, Fed Up, Sound Off, the Lewis McCord Free Press, and distributed GI press papers and camp news and the Seattle Draft and Military Counseling Service, which became part of the GI Rights Hotline. Eventually, VVAW had chapters in Seattle, Alaska, Bellingham, Portland, Eugene, Lane County, and Astoria, Oregon. There were many chapters in California. Regional gatherings were regularly convened in a pre-digital era for letter, phone calls, newspaper distribution, leafletting, and speaking events protests. VVAW provided the groundwork of, as Michael mentioned, for veteran GI activism that can seen in the many veterans activist organizations, including Vietnam Veterans 
of America, Veterans for Peace, Iraq, Iraq Vets Against the War, Soldier of Heart, Vets, Votes, etc. I'd like to show for the camera just some of this, which hasn't been shown yet before. Uh, these are newspapers that were distributed as Fed Up from Fort Lewis. This is Fort Lewis VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War. There's a chapter there. This is a brochure that was pr produced by the Seattle Dra or excuse me, the uh, Washington Alaska uh, v Vietnam Veterans Against the War. You've seen that the Fort Lewis Lewis McCord Free Press. GI Press Service, GI Press Service, GI Press Service, Puget Sound Sound Off, and Camp News, which was a news of the GI movement. So this is just a sample of, of some of the some of the publications that were available, and uh, there were a lot more, you know, that were originally around the other. I also like to mention a couple of other things or show, and that is this was one of the first Vietnam Veterans Against the War newspapers, the first casualty. And another edition. I've got some of the more recent editions of Vietnam Veterans Against the War on the table back there, which you're free to have. And these are actually all of this material is going to go into a special collection at the University of Washington Library. Um, one of the things that was mentioned was was the uh, Seattle Drafting Military Counseling Center and that organization, which I worked in, and also one of my uh, comrades, uh, Percy Hilo worked at it also. That was a local organization mostly with Quakers going back to the Second World War in Korea. Most of those people are gone now, but they, that organization morphed into the supporting the GI rights hotline. And it was an important uh, bridge really between oh, World War II, Korea, and, Stop. And, and what we have now. An important organization to remember and uh, thank the people who worked on it uh, when I say we're largely clear. So that's about it I've got for now. So thank you very much. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, start off uh, kind of where Mike uh, ended uh, and kind of fill in the gap between uh, kind of the slow decline of uh, VA, VVAW um, uh, till the time uh, VFP started. And uh, I mean, Mike's presentation showed that uh, VVAW was a very effective and uh, strong organization in organizing uh, veterans to help bring the war to an end. So he mentions uh, that VVA was kind of at its peak in 1973, but it's also the year after the signing of the Paris Peace Agreement that uh, activity and membership in, in, in the VVA began to uh, uh, decline. And then after the end of the war in 1975, um, it continued to uh, in its acti activity and membership. So after the war, um, veterans were moving on with their lives, and, and they what they really needed was um, health care and 
an advocate group to, to begin to um, advocate for them for their physical and, and mental um, injuries. So in 1978, uh, veterans, including many, many from VBA, started a new organization to meet those needs, Vietnam Veterans of America, VBA. Uh, chartered by Congress as a service organization dedicated to the veterans and their families, it eventually established 650 chapters around the country with membership around 80,000 at its peak. VBA has been and is an aggressive advocate for Vietnam veterans, lobbying con Congress, getting legislation passed that recognizes and compensates dis disabilities uh, from that war, uh, like PTSD and, and Agent Orange, just to name a few. So after VBA A's devolution in the waning years of 1970, there was not an active anti-war veterans organization until Veterans for Peace was established in 1985. A small group of veterans from World War II, wars from Korea and Vietnam, came together and founded BB VFP to initially oppose the U.S. proxy wars in Central America and to raise awareness of the new dangers of a nuclear war. Believing as veteran resistors before them that they had a unique opportunity and obligation to speak out against the war, VFP began building an anti-war peace organization that is still going strong to this day. Today, VFP is made up of 130 chapters in every state of, of the Union, six chapters outside the United States. Um, and VFP consists of veterans and associate non-veteran members of like mind who span the generation from World War II to the current post-9-11 veterans. And if you've seen the exhibit, many of the veterans there are leaders in Veterans for Peace uh, today. Well, it took a while for things to get going here in the Pacific Northwest. It was almost three decades before the Seattle chapter was established here. And that got started when George Bush became a, began an un totally, uh, a unwarranted war in Iraq. And so Seattle Chapter 92 was chartered in February 2003 with Mike Dietrich as its first president. Chapters were formed around the same time in Bellingham, Tacoma, Everett, and Olympia. Veterans resistance and protest was once again active in the Pacific Northwest. Well, I want to try to say a little say more about uh, Veterans for Peace. And I think the best way to understand what um, Veterans for Peace is all about is through its statements of purpose. And there are six of them. But given the time, I'm only going to be able to elaborate on, uh, elaborate on two of them. But I want to mention the other four uh, before we get to that. So our statement of purpose, number one, is Veterans for Peace will work with others to increase the public awareness of the cost of war. Two, to seek justice for veterans and victims of war. Three, to end racism and repression in our home communities and oppose the militarization of law enforcement. And four, to abolish war as an instrument of national policy. So one I'll elaborate on a little more is, um, is this, to restrain our government from intervening overtly and, and covertly in the in internal affairs of other nations. 
And this pers purpose aligns very much with the GI and veterans movement who are resisting and protesting our government intervention in Vietnam. Following their exa example, we, uh, we protest, we rally, we march with our banners, flags, and signs against every war since our founding, finding them to be unnecessary, illegal, and unjustified. Further, we act actively oppose proxy wars, sanctions, drone warfare, and the foreign policy that leads our government to invade and occupy other sovereign countries, and countries that leads to endless war. And we call out the covert warfare of our government's use of state departments like USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy that promotes regime change of democratic governments. So Mike uh, mentioned one of the ways we protest with the annual Veterans uh, Parade. And I'm going to say a little more about that. Um, so this happens in uh, Auburn, Washington. It's billed as the largest Veterans Parade this side of the Mississippi. With close to 200 contingents, we are the only anti-war veterans organization to provide an alternative to the ubiquitous veneration of veterans and the glorification of war that is on full display there. Well, I might mention, after several years in the parade, the officials decided that we didn't fit this veterans military parade. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, maybe it was our peace flags we, we carry, <laughs> or maybe it was because we didn't salute the flag as we passed by, by the reviewing stand. Or maybe it is this statement that is read as we pass the reviewing stand with high-ranking military brass looking on. Veterans for Peace honors our country's veterans and active military personnel by working to restrain our government from intervening in the internal affairs of other nations and by working to abolish war as an instrument of national policy so that no soldier will ever have to place his or her life in jeopardy for an unjust cause. So whatever the reason was, they kicked us out. <laughs> and uh, we, we considered just just going and marching in the parade anyway. You know, what are they going to do? Arrest veterans at a Veterans Day parade? It wouldn't look very good. But we wanted to, uh, on second thought, to have an official and more uh, uh, permanent solution. So we asked the ACLU for help in reversing this decision. They sued the city on our behalf and won our case before a federal judge who mandated the city reinstate us on First Amendment and other grounds. And we haven't had any trouble since over the years. We are finding more and more acceptance for our peace perspective from thousands of people lining the streets of the parade route. So the Veterans Parade is always on the Saturday before Veterans Day. So what we do on Veter Veterans Day is we celebrate Hermes' Day which is the original name of the holiday that cel celebrates the end of World War II and the peace that followed. So we, so we, uh, are, what did I say? World War I. Real, <laughs> World War I, yes. Um, so we gather at St. James Cathedral on the 11th, in the 11th month, on the 11th day, at the 11th hour, and St. James rings the bells 11 times. And we do that uh, every year to celebrate peace. Well, another way we try to influence uh, public discussion about is issues of US foreign policy, militarism, and war is we create these position statements. Um, they come mostly from our national board or board of directors. On topics we consider 
needing a perspective from a, an anti-war and peace orientation. These statements not only help focus the work of our chapters, but they also offer to the are offered to the media for publication. Since 2010, we have written 150 position statements on various topics. A few examples. The war in Ukraine, the war on terrorism, the Pentagon budget, the imprisonment of Julia Sean, sanctions on Venezuela, the militarization of space, and the new military branch Space Force, and the policy that gives military equipment to local police departments, and hundreds more. So all 150 statements are on our website, vfp.org, if you want to check any of those out. And to advocate for peace on a global scale, um, we are fortunate to have a permanent non-voting NGO seat at the United Nations to speak out on, an, on at that forum about war and peace. Okay, the other um, the other um, statement of purpose. Um, that I'm going to say a little more about is uh, to end the arms race and to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. So we have lots of national working groups that individuals or chapters can be part of that work on some of our larger issues. And one of them is the Nuclear Abolition Working Group. And it calls on our government and other nuclear nations to sign the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also known as the Ban Treaty, that has made nuclear weapons illegal and mandates that the nuclear nations begin the process of reducing and eliminating nuclear weapons. And it also raises awareness of the U.S. violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty by creating a nuclear posture review statement that identifies these violations, modernizing our nuclear arsenal, the development of new nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and the fail, failure to begin reducing our nuclear weapons in order to eliminate them as the treaty requires. Also, our chapter often participates in the protests at Ground Zero on the Kitsap Peninsula, right by the Bangor Trident's nuclear submarine base that has the world's uh, third largest deployable nuclear arsenal. And a number of our chapter members are arrested each year in civil disobedient actions uh, there. So in the last few minutes I have, I want to talk about our chapter's military counter-recruiting program that involves talking to high school stu students about the military. One of the reasons we are passionate about counter-recruiting, also known as truth in recruiting or alternate recruiting, is because many of us veterans wished we had had somebody to come and talk to us in high school about the military from a different perspective other than the narrative one gets from the government and the military. But most important, we want students to have their alternative uh, perspective and become fully aware of what they're signing up for and to relate information to them that the military recruiters don't talk about. So Seattle VFP 92 is the military counter-recruiter for the Seattle Public High Schools. We have the same access to students as the military recruiters have. We go into the high schools when the military is scheduled to be there, so we can provide that alternative. As veterans, we get, can give them a realistic understanding of what it's like to be a soldier. Of course, as people have mentioned, things are different now than when I was drafted 50 years, more than 50 years ago. With an all-voluntary military now, the branches have to persuade students that the military is a good place for them to spend eight years of their life. So the military branches, they come with a lot of free stuff to give away. Water bottles, keychains, you name it. And 
so they can entice students to come and talk to them at, at their table during the lunchtime in the cafeteria. Well, we can't compete with their billion dollar recruiting budgets, so we have had to devise a way to get students to come uh, up to our table and talk to us on their lunch break. <coughs> so we developed a quiz, a military IQ quiz. Now you'd think that's the last thing students would want to do when they're not in class and when they're eating their lunch. But students of that age think they know everything, right? <laughs> and so they are challenged to come up and see how well they can do on the quiz. And what they learn taking the multiple choice quiz is they really don't know very much about the military. One question is asked, is the military a good place to learn skills that prepare you for a career when you leave the military? Overwhelming, they answer yes, and that is the line touted by the military. It is the number one reason people enlist for the opportunity they think the military will provide to, to learn a job skill and to pay for college when they get out. This, of course, is especially attractive to lower income students, students of color who have fewer fewer options, and want to improve their economic stance, standing. This is why it's often referred to as a per poverty draft. But the correct answer is probably not. As Dick Cheney famously said, the military is not a jobs program. The military trains you to be a soldier and fight wars. While certainly some jobs in the military will help you when you get out, Realistically, many won't. That's why you see a higher percentage of veterans in the civilian population that are homeless and unemployed. And when you go looking for a career, shouldn't you know the occupational hazards of the organization you are considering joining? We think it's important that women know that the Military can be a toxic environment for them when 33% of the women in the military have been sexually assaulted. And no doubt it's a higher percentage because many don't, don't report or are afraid to pour, report or discouraged from reporting. And potential recruits ought to know that there's something about the military experience that causes on average 20 20 active military and veterans to commit suicide every day. Then, we, then they have a, a history question to answer about U.S. wars. The question for them is how many defensive wars has the U.S. fought since World War II? Majority course answer, any fair from 2 to 12, few choosing the correct answer of none. As a sole superpower, the U doesn't, U U.S. doesn't fight defensive wars. This leads to a discussion of U.S. foreign policy and why our governments fights these wars we are involved in around the globe. It brings up the question of what they are willing to put their li lives on the line for and whether they are okay with ki killing other human beings for that cause. Telling students that our government orders military men and women to fight undeclared wars on false pretenses where Americans are widely seen as invaders is far different from what the recruiters tell recruits are the government's reason to involve themselves in other countries' affairs. Usually something about freedom and democracy and what someone earlier said that if we don't fight them there, we'll fight them, have to fight them over here. Also, it's important for them to know that, that the fine print of their enlistment contract stipulates that despite what a recruiter may have promised them or that they signed up for, it could all change depending on the needs of the military. When the quiz is done, we share our experience in the military and why we counsel pursuits other than the military and share some alter to read, alter alternative career paths. Several years ago when doing a story on military recruitment in Seattle, an Army, Army recruiter told Fox News that Seattle was the hardest place for them to recruit young people into the military. 
we feel we can take a little credit for that, but what we're hoping is that we can help foster a new generation of young people to become resistors to joining the military, much like the resistors you've heard about today with similar, similar results, make it dif making it difficult, if not impossible, for U.S. to fight unnecessary legal wars. So finally, I think we, it can be said that the veteran anti-war peace movement in the PIS Pacific Northwest con continues the legacy and protest of resistance to war in the struggle for peace. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Atkinson, and um, I'm a war resistor. I joined the all-volunteer force. Um, what is the all-volunteer force? Well, that was just something created at the end of uh, Vietnam, so that it was kind of a way to save face. Um, anybody coming after that was coming in as a volunteer, right? Um, so if you're a volunteer, you know what you're getting into. Um, you know what's you know what's going on. Um, I was 17 years old, and I went with my mother and uh, a friend of hers, who intended to enlist. I did not. Um, and uh, I was immediately, uh, it was, I swear the recruiters had a three martini lunch that day because it was just a cakewalk when I walked right in. Uh, it was the easiest conversion ever. Um, I had no resources. I grew up in a, a home that was both financially and emotionally unstable. We moved a lot. Um, and. Uh, I saw it as a way out. Uh, I was going to go make my mark in the world. Um, and I'm happy that Seattle is a, a place where kids are least likely to be recruited. Uh, what concerns me most, however, are kids in rural Wyoming, kids in Utah, kids in rural Indiana. I'm from downstate Illinois. Um, so that the kids that are growing up <coughs> with, in a really pretty structured community where there's not a lot of room to be anything other than heterosexual, Christian, and for the most part white. Um, there's some certain expectations in those communities. Um, my high school counselor was actually in the very Army Reserve unit that I would join. Um, <clears throat> so he had no disincentive to uh, counter-recruit me. When I enlisted, um, I couldn't get a loan for a car. I couldn't buy anything on layaway, couldn't vote, couldn't drink, couldn't do things that teenagers are not supposed to do, but probably do anyway. Um, but for some reason, I could enlist with my parents' um, you know, endorsement, essentially. Um, and the military tells kids anything they want to hear. Um, you know, uh, it, it's the best used car salesman that you've ever seen. These people have quotas, and they're very driven. Um, and they'll say whatever it is that appeals to you. And it's really about sleuthing a person. You know, well, tell me about yourself, and what are your aspirations, and what do you want to do? And then uh, this, 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 this script gets written that's very tailored to you um, about how they're going to change your life and make your life so much better if you just sign on this dotted line. What you're signing is a unilateral contract that is not anything can be changed about you, your situation, at any time. I remember in basic training, um, because I'm a rather fair person, getting a, a sunburn and um, <clears throat> being told that I was going to be uh, given an Article 15 for attempted uh, destruction of government property because I had sunburned yeah. myself. Uh, it, it just is reinforcing the fact, uh, it wasn't about the sunburn, it's about reinforcing the notion that we are property and that they own us. Um, it was really obvious to me that I was a mismatch at 17. Even in the, the volatile home life that I'd grown up in, um, I was used to uh, mitigating conflicts um, you know, by appeasing or, or setting up agreements. or I just knew how to make myself small, essentially, uh, and diffuse that violet. And that did not cut it in basic training. Um, it was not effective. They didn't want to hear that every week I'd ask to go home, every week I'd be told to get my ass back out in the field. And um, <clears throat> You know, the, the advanced weapons training that you all had back in the day, that's just par for the course these days. I have rocked a, an M50 in big stick in the foxhole. 
probably because I'm a big ass girl from the Midwest. Um, you know, uh, the Claymore Mines front towards enemy. If that doesn't tell you anything, okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, kids, everybody remembers being 17, and if you don't, ask your 17 year old grandkid. Okay? It's a very vulnerable place right now for young people. Um, recruiters come to high schools, um, and, but there's, a, there's an extra pernicious little element where you don't see them. Recruiters talk to your kids or your grandkids by engaging them in games. Um, they engage them in, by, you know, fronting esports teams. Uh, by getting on uh, Discord channels and talking to your kids. You'd be really upset if I told you that your kids were talking to pedophiles. But I hope that you would be equally, if not more, upset that recruiters are talking to your kids and playing games with them and forming symbiotic relationships with them. And before long, uh, you know, earning their trust and, you know, getting them into the military. This is the way it is now. It is not there's no leafleting. It's, it's, it's coming in a different way. It's coming in a way that you have to be aware of. You have to be attentive. Um, <clears throat> there's a group called Gamers for Peace. It's uh, part of Veterans for Peace. And what we do is get in a Discord channel and we try to dismantle uh, the crap that the military produces, <laughs> essentially. Uh, when the most recent Top Gun movie came out, uh, we just spent a Friday night talking about what a bunch of crap it was, uh, how much it, it, it trades on um, these myths about what is masculinity, uh, what does an American look like, uh, you know, does an American look like Tom Cruise, does he represent your interests, you know, um, and, and trying to defeat uh, uh, these images and, and, and get to kids, it's like what can we do to to do anything, you know, what, what can we do now that there's not an act of war doesn't mean that there's active peace. And I want to tell you that after Vietnam, they learned their lesson. They learned the lesson about how to do damage control. Because when I came along after serving six years, I had short-term disease really hard and just wanted to get the hell out. It's called quiet quitting today. If you guys are familiar with quiet quitting, that's what I did for six years. I quiet quit. The last time that I was on the range um, to qualify, because you have to, you have to qualify every year. Um, the last time I was on the range, I just threw it on automatic and just let that clip. And then Eddie just got, oh, it pissed him off. It made him really angry. With it. I'm like, well, I'm done. <laughs> um, you know, quiet quitting, trying to make things difficult, um, uh, monkey wrenching. I used to, because I was from Illinois and I grew up in a rural downstate and I had driven tractors, uh, when I got to basic training, they decided, wow, she can drive a deuce and a half. Oh, yeah. um, so I would repeatedly forget my driver's license in my BDU pants so that when they went out to laundry, oh, I don't know what happened to my license, I can't drive anybody today. Um, so just know that an all-volunteer force, uh, just because someone enlists now, um, there's a lot of things that drive people to enlist, um, it's not the same as the draft. The government learned that the draft doesn't work um, <clears throat> because people get resistance. But I want you to know that the people that are that are being that are going in now that are enlisting, they need that support as well. Um, <clears throat> Gamers for Peace is one way to support uh, younger people. Um, I think one of the things about the movement that I feel very strongly about is being proactive versus reactive. It's like, I know that maintaining that level um, of work during Vietnam is, you're like revved up, you're right here, you're resisting, and it's hot. And then when the war is over, everybody kind of loses interest. 
I picked a really bad time to resist a war. I resisted the first Gulf War, which everyone thought was a raging freaking success. People loved that war. It was one and done. They were in and out. And I was trying to support Marines at Camp Lejeune, uh, who were in the brig, and who were being threatened with things like the death penalty for uh, refusing to activate the war. It's like, well, do we have a war? Because doesn't Congress have to declare a war before you can start talking about giving somebody the death penalty? And a lot of people don't know about that uh, because it was just in the, in the support for the war, in the run-up to the war, and we saw this repeated again with uh, the, the second Iraq conflict or the never-ending war in Iraq and the never-ending war in Afghanistan. Um, you know... I don't know what shifted that that we let two wars run concurrently for 20 years. Um, and, and it just disturbs me that, well, because those people were volunteers, that maybe it doesn't count. Um, I want to encourage people to be on the ready, be looking for that opportunity. That there are GIs right now who need our help. There are veterans who are coming back now that need our help. My, my thing was really insignificant. I, I met another guy who was like a, a resistor to the Panama, and we're like, oh, yeah, we had those tiny little conflicts. Does anybody even remember Panama? Noriega? <laughs> this was like in the greater scheme of things because they were brief conflicts. But the thing is, that's the way that the military is conducting war now. There's so many miniature wars, so much interference going on chronically, that we get kind of, if it's not a big flashbang boom, that we just kind of get accustomed to it. Uh, what, you know, everything that's going on in Yemen. Uh, the way that we actually do war, we do it by drones now. There's a guy, several guys sitting in Las Vegas at Creech Air Force Base. They go home to their, their wives and kids every night at 5 o'clock managing that Las Vegas traffic, and some of them are bothered by it, some of them are not. This guy, Daniel Hale, is in the penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. Right. What a horrible place. Right. That's where they put Noriega after they captured him. And <clears throat> I'll, write, I'll wind up my comments here shortly. Um, I don't want to go over time, I want to be mindful, but I just want to say that uh, when you have a young man who confesses and says, I am I am disturbed by what I do. This is not a video game. Um, it, it's for real. And when he <clears throat> is given more time, um, and his only life is in uh, uh, maximum security, the place that they put serial killers is, is a shame. So my <clears throat> request is that is there more that people can do? It's like, yes, there's lots of stuff that we can do, that the peace movement can continue. There's always something. Just because we're not always aware of it, it doesn't get the attention, or we don't hear about it in the same way, doesn't mean that it isn't occurring. Um, young people do amazing stuff with uh, organizing around this kid, Daniel Hale. And just write a letter. Uh, if, you can, if you can find a, an hour or two on a Saturday to write a letter to a guy and send him some photographs uh, that he can put, you know, in his cell that say, you know, we're thinking about you. We recognize that what you have done, um, we know that you enlisted. Okay, so you enlisted, big deal. But what we appreciate is the action that you're taking to resist now. Um, I think that might be my 10 minutes. Fifteen, and you have some more time. Oh, I can have more time. Yeah, oh, yeah, I forgot to resist. <laughs> tell you that I work for a group called Courage to Resist. Um, Courage to Resist is really me and Jeff Patterson. Jeff Patterson was a Marine. Um, when I was thinking about resisting, I had made a decision at uh, I was stop lost. What that means is that uh, George Bush, the elder, decided that after the uh, <clears throat> invasion of Iraq and Kuwait, that they were going to stop loss. And that's exactly what it is, stop the loss. If you're going to retire, forget it. Medical discharge, probably not. Uh, if your time is simply d done, which mine was, I was like, I did by six years, I'm going to get out of here, quiet quitting, quiet quitting. 
if I, if I just whistle past the graveyard, nothing's going to happen, right? It's never going to be me. The difference between a soldier and a resistor is sometimes just whether or not they've been activated for deployment. I meet resistor, or I meet recruiters all the time when I go to visit high schools. And um, they'll say things like, oh man, why'd you get out? And I'm like, well, you know. And they'll say, well, I'm 12 years in, I'm going to do 20. I'm like, really? I'm like, man, how many times have you been deployed? None. <laughs> so he's counting on the next eight years uh, of just good fortune that maybe he will not be deployed anywhere. Um, that's the difference between a resistor and, and, and you know, it's just, it's just about controlling the time and trying to play a waiting game and really trying to um, <clears throat> make sure that you're you, LP, low profile, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to say any more before... Uh, I introduced Joy Damiani, uh, who's been spending the last couple of days with me. Um, she is uh, someone who actually served in Iraq after I did. It breaks my heart because as Veterans for Peace, our ultimate mission is to put ourselves out of business. <laughs> because if there's no more war, there's no more veterans. Our goal should be to put ourselves out of business. Um, and I really feel strongly about the generations that have come after me. Uh, it, it depresses me. It makes me feel like, darn, I didn't get to that one, you know. Uh, I didn't get to that kid in, in time to affect change. You, you never know. Uh, I visit schools all the time. I always try to meet with a recruiter and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Stephanie Atkinson. We'll be seeing a lot of each other this academic year. I'd like to invite you to join Veterans for Peace. It's free for active duty members. Um, and sometimes it's really encouraging. I, I talked to a really sweet Marine a recruiter, and he's like, actually, I'm always kind of surprised when they say yes. <laughs> so my request of you is, with your experience as veterans, members of the community, parents, grandparents, that military resistance never stops. I'm so grateful for the example that you all set, but it never stops. Um, courage to resist. Right now we have set up a phone line for uh, <clears throat> resistors in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. We don't care if you're between the ages of 18 and 65 and you're a male, we don't care. We don't care if you are religiously opposed to the war. Not, we, we don't care. We make no judgment. We just know that in order to make war stop, it counts on the individual actions of human beings. And if there's no kids getting recruited, um, then there's no soldiers. You know. If we're, if we're asking our kids, hey, what are you, who are you talking to? Oh, really, Sergeant so-and-so, if you saw your kid go out down on the street and talk to some guy in uniform, I would be freaked out, personally. I'd be like, get your butt in the house right now. So we want to be cognizant of where they're coming for kids and presenting an alternative and, and being expressive and being proud about being resistors, about being veterans who have served and, and have an alternative perspective, um, it's really important that we know that we are not there yet. Please don't stop what you're doing. Joey Damiani, and I am um, really honored to be here with y'all today. Uh, I don't think I've had a chance to tell my opinion to a whole room of people in a while. <laughs> um, and but I, I don't have a notebook in front of me because I feel like I connect better 
with people when I'm not constantly looking down at what I thought I was going to say and then saying something different anyway. So um, I'll, a little bit about me. I was recruited into the Army out of Syracuse, New York. Um, I had just kind of escaped a really fucked up reform school that made the military look like a way easier alternative. <laughs> and it kind of was. Um, that's a whole other story. That's the next book. <laughs> but um, I joined the Army at 19, seeing it as the best option to um, get the job training I wanted. I wanted to be a journalist. And uh, the recruiter who got my name and number from community college um, said, I can get you a journalist job in the Army. And I was like, oh, really? And, um, and he was like, yeah, um, you know, I can, you, and you'll get paid. You'll get like $26,000 a year, which as a 19-year-old with nothing was like, Shh. I was like, yeah, sure, let's do that. Great. And my parents, who had just seen me like run away from reform school, they were like, you want to join the Army? But they didn't try to talk me out of it. And they didn't give me any viable alternatives, right? Um, they kind of let me do it to teach me a lesson for dropping out of reform school, I think. Um, and again, that's a whole other situation, but it's related to the fact that if there had been a viable alternative for me, I wouldn't have done it. I looked into the Peace Corps. You need a four-year degree to go into the Peace Corps. I looked into it and I was like, well, I can't afford to go into the Peace Corps because I can't go to school. Um, and there weren't any other, you know, organizations out there saying, giving a, as much of like an attractive option as the military. Like, we're going to give you training in something like the career that you're interested in. We're going to pay you. We're going to give you a way out of your hometown and out from under your parents' authority, which, I mean, I think a lot of us grew up resisting our parents as the first, the first <laughs> source of oppression, right? <laughs> and so the military is like, allow us, come on in, resisting your parents, eh? <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I thought of it as, as a better solution, and nobody offered me anything better. And so I joined. And I was sent to the Defense Information School to learn how to be an Army journalist slash public affairs specialist. Because it's the same job. And if you don't know that those two things are opposite jobs in the real world, <laughs> they're opposite jobs. So I was brought into the very Orwellian Defense Information School, and I was taught how to um, create the news that the army wanted to share with my fellow soldiers. I was taught how to mix the Kool-Aid, essentially, and I was trained in how to work with the media and how to coach soldiers on what to say to the media because the soldiers weren't going to encounter the media except the ones that were allowed to talk to them because the government learned from Vietnam you can't just give the media access to soldiers. And because now we have these um, corporate news agencies where there really isn't a lot of independent journalism that can get funded and can get access, you know, there aren't a lot of journalists who are even necessarily willing to try to go around those angles. Like, um, <coughs> so I was, I was in the Army for six years and then I got out and I went back to study, uh, I went back to school on my GI Bill to study the Middle East and find out the context and find out why it was all so fucked and why we had, how we had fucked it. And, um, and, you know, I had, I had a lot of things taught to me that I was not aware of. I learned, you know, I was, I was encountering Iraq veterans against the war at the same time as I was going back to school and studying, um, and studying the Middle East at UC Berkeley, where I was learning Arabic, and, I, and also it was during Occupy, right? Yeah. So in 2011, I was in school. I, had been, I went, I'm not going to talk a ton about my time in Iraq because, like, I don't think anybody in this room is like uncertain about the Iraq war being fucked. Like we all know that it was based on lies and we all know that it was essentially intended to go on forever and to create our presence, to establish our presence in the Middle East. There was no liberation going on there and I think everyone in this room knows that. So um, the thing that happened when I got out of the military is I wanted to get as far away from the military as I could. So I started traveling around um, on a little road trip and eventually through, I don't know, I think cosmic interventions here, there and everywhere, 
I ended up in California, um, in the Bay Area, dating and then married to a, a jam band musician whose community was all like the quote unquote hippies that I had been like reading about. Because I read the electric Kool-Aid acid test while I was in training in the army. And I was like, I really have fucked up here. I've like joined. And so when I got out of the army, I was like, let's go to those people. Like, oh, like this is all of the, like the hippies, right? And I started eventually calling that group the tie-dye patriarchy because what I realized is it's like what we have is we have like the, the forces that are toxic in this country of colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, and patriarchy, they take so many different forms, right? And like because our oppressors are smart, they know that you can't just be overt with your violence anymore. You have to, um, you have to like diversify your violence, right? <laughs> and um, so, whereas like the the quote unquote, the hippies felt like, all right, well, we won the Vietnam thing, everything's great, and we resisted the Iraq War, kinda. We marched and stuff, and now we've got Obama. Isn't that great? And I was like, have you seen what Obama's doing to Occupy? <laughs> have you seen the way that, um, you know, the people who are supposedly the good guys are talking to people like me who don't fit the description of, of even a veteran? And, and as I was getting involved in the anti-war veterans movement, I encountered a lot of very well-intentioned human beings, a lot of white men who looked at me like, oh honey, what do you have to say? And I was like, well, motherfucker, I just got back from Iraq. What do you think I have to say? <laughs> and, but the thing is that like, I wasn't palatable to them. And I, so I, and so what I realized is, you know, the anti-war movement needs to be the anti-oppression movement. And we need to de decolonize ourselves. Because what I saw going in is that we, first of all, I felt like when, when Occupy started, it took a minute for me to understand that it's not just resisting a war or resisting um, a certain type of oppression. Like, these are all the same oppression that are different flavors, right? Like, Occupy was so powerful because it took the energy of all of these movements and brought them together, and that's why it had to be crushed so violently. And that was under a Democratic president, right? And I think that people younger than me kind of are able to look and see at the fact that it's not politicians who are ever going to save us, and they benefit way too much off of throwing us bones here and there and uh, pretending to be the good guys. And what we really need to be building is alternative places for people to come when they can see very clearly the government, the military isn't good. It's an option that is like when we don't have um, universal basic income and we don't have tax funded college and we don't have vocational um, training <laughs> programs and we are not paying people to do the work that gets that keeps the country moving, like educating and healthcare and even, you know, infrastructure, you know, then the government and the, the powers that be are going to keep having power because we're not, all we're doing is resisting. We're not building and we're not paying attention to the groups that are not us that have been doing this work, you know, like it's, there are a lot of, um, I think people who look in this room and they're like well there's not a lot of people in this room so the war resistance movement must be small and it's like actually no it's just taking all different kinds of forms it's mutual aid it's resisting um you know employment oppression like giving people a place to come to when they need to quit their toxic job or leave their toxic spouse or you know and acknowledging the fact that when we get out of the military and join the peace movement we haven't necessarily deprogrammed ourselves from the military. We need to rehumanize ourselves and recognize that we have had patriarchy, misogyny, imperialism, colonialism literally pounded into our brains. And we don't notice it all the time until we're like, why doesn't anybody want to work with us? Huh. <laughs> it's like, well, maybe we're the assholes we don't want to see in the world. And maybe we need to, we need to, to do this work within ourselves. So the last um, few years, and I will say, like, I'm, I'm no longer with the musician I was married to because the more I got 
um, educated about what resistance really meant. And the more I started calling out things like cultural appropriation in the jam band scene, <laughs> which <laughs> they don't really like that that all, like at all. Um, the more I started realizing that like the progressives aren't going to help me either. And what I needed to do was like be the revolution I wanted to see in the world instead of being the asshole that I was resisting. And, um, and that was, you know, in order to do that, I had to let go of my ego, first of all. Like, yes, I am a veteran. Does that mean that I have, like, the trademark on resistance and on outrage and indignation? No. Like, look at all of these people who've been getting systemically oppressed even without joining the military. Um, that's not my phone, is it? No. Um, and so, and then the other thing I um, came to having a kind of have a dance moment. <laughs> Just go with it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> this is intergenerational teamwork. Right? <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> Seriously. Like, I'll make a joke, but I will say, like, I don't know shit, right? Like, I just turned 40, and I'm, like, planning to lean into it by, like, being the don't give a fuck person in the room as much as possible. Um, and just saying the quiet part loud. Because, like, we're in the apocalypse, right? Like, we know that. I don't know if everyone in this room realizes it, but, like, within, like, five to ten years, all, all y'all's babies and grandbabies are going to be fighting water wars. Like, it's just real. Like, I've chosen not to have kids because I don't want to put anybody into this world right now. Like, we are in a time and a place where we can't, we, we have to be, like, recognizing what is going on. The resistance is already going on. And taking our egos out and joining into whatever is going like maybe it's not vets for peace that's leading the re revolution maybe it's members of veterans for peace getting deeply engaged in our communities and talking to the kids and asking them how we can help them like do you need some money so that you don't need to join the military let's do a gofundme so you don't have to join the military or like let's pay for your school so you can go to law school you know uh, which is lead, leads me to the last thing i wanted to say which is that I've, I stepped back from working with organizations over the last few years because I realized that a lot of my energy was getting drained in meetings and at demonstrations where all of my, I was like going out and being full of rage and then going home and being exhausted. And I was like, this isn't helping. Um, what I really need to do is find ways to be sustainably resisting. And um, so that's why I was like, I need to work on my book, which is about all the questions that people have asked me about the military that I haven't had time or energy to tell them. Like, these are the things that led me to join, and these are the things that I learned when I was in, and I've tried to make it somewhat entertaining, along with the death and the violence. There's jokes. Um, <laughs> because it is, it's like you have to have a sense of humor or you lose your mind, right? And so, and, and my next step is I'm um, going to be going to law school because I, I feel like now, I've, I live off of my disability, right? The, the, the VA has acknowledged that they have broken my brain. They have rated me unemployable. So at age 40, the government has decided I'm no longer compatible with capitalism, yeah. which I'm fine with. Yeah. <laughs> it just means that I get to keep myself alive on like tax dollars and shit and talk shit about the people who are spending tax dollars wrongly. Um, and that's my, that's my form of resistance. And we all can do all of these things, you know, and, and I think we all are, or else we wouldn't be in this room. Um, but, um, yeah, it really starts inside. And the last thing I will say is, um, you know, a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, I was invited to join a delegation from Veterans for Peace in Nicaragua. And I don't know, I'm sure there's different opinions on that trip that happened. And I did not know anything about Nicaragua when I was asked to, um, to be on that, on that trip. And this is, this is a conversation that gets uncomfortable with a lot of VFP folks, because I will say, I was specifically invited on that trip and I was told by the person who invited me, we need somebody, uh, a woman vet veteran of your generation to go. And I was thinking in the back of my mind, I was like, well, that's really token-y, but I was like, but I'll still go <laughs> because I'm interested and I'm engaged. 
And the person who asked me, there was no part of them in their mind that was thinking, what I'm doing is tokenizing this person. I am telling, I'm literally telling them that we need someone who fits the description to sit in this chair. And when I got to Nicaragua and I started using my voice and participating in some of the conversations that were happening, I was being given looks by some of these older male veterans, like, why are you talking? You're here to be a delegate. You know, like, you're not here to question this. And then when we got back from that delegation, um, I had a lot of opinions about it that came out after I started talking to more people. Because as someone who didn't know about the history of VFP in Nicaragua, and how VFP began really in response to US intervention in Nicaragua, I was, I was not as in, involved in that narrative, right, as some of the other vets who were there, who saw the Nicaraguan government as a US resistance government. Um, for me, what I saw was this is a government, and, and this was actually after we got back, and a lot of other VFP members started challenging me, like, why did you go to Nicaragua and meet with Ortega and allow him to put you up on a platform? And I was like, well, why did we do that, actually? Um, let me ask. And what it turned out was that there are members of this organization who believe that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and who believe that there is a government out there that just because it resists the US is, is that that is a government we should support. And the fact is that when I raised those issues with the people who, who um, led that delegation, I was shut down and I was, I was talked down to. And it, it really um, put a bad flavor into my mouth about, about working with older veterans. Because I said, look, I raised an issue that was a very valid issue that should have been addressed. And it wasn't. And I was shut out. So if we want to keep building intergenerational struggle, we need to take our egos out <laughs> and we need to say, look, this person is raising some really important questions about the way that we're resisting. And we can't just be, stand on our, on our platform as, well, I'm a resistor, so I'm probably right. And be like, well, like, you just don't know. You just don't know. Okay. Because the fact is that like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Like, the, 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 the oppressors are smart. And they're getting smarter. You know, they're on the internet. They're making the memes. You know, <laughs> they're doing the thing. And like, like the government speaks meme now. Like the like they 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 have all of the access that we have. And the the worst thing that we can ever do is start feeling like because we are on the side of the resistance that we like know how to resist because we actually don't. And um, you know, I I think that. If I had received more support for my critique of our VFP resistance, then I might have stayed more active in VFP. And um, I was very, I, I was glad to be invited to come and speak here. And I knew that I was probably going to say some things that might make people a little uncomfortable. But that's okay, because that's what resistors do, right? We make people uncomfortable. We lean into that shit, right? If we're not, then like, what if we're not looking? Why? Then we'll just go be safe and old somewhere. Like I don't intend to be safe and old. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like we need to be okay with being unsafe because the rest of the world is, and we have this stamina now just for being here that we can use to build, to pay forward, and um, support people who are resisting better than us. But like they're out resisting. That's why they're not in this room. They're out fucking shit up, right? <laughs> <laughs> or you know, we're learning that. So that's why I'm saying like. Um, thank you all for listening to me, and it, it, I've any, I'm sorry, not sorry for anything I've said that's made anyone uncomfortable. Um, but just, I appreciate all of you and all of your energy and all of your passion because it fuels mine, and and I want to keep keep giving that to our next generations and keep reminding ourselves that they are more all right <laughs> than we think, that they're paying attention, and they're might, maybe even paying better attention than us sometimes. So, thank you. Well, the panel was great. Thank you very much. So now we have time for some questions from the audience. Any questions, or are you just so odd? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, tired. Nothing tired. to say. Tired. One, one thing that I do want to say um, is, and I think Jory spoke to it a great deal, the answer to much of this is building community. Um, not just resistance, but actually building. Um, people, we wonder why people don't join like with us. Um, I think one, and I've asked this many times in places, how many people believe peace is possible? I've asked this, thank you, I've asked this <laughs> amongst peace people. You know, so I ask you, how many of you believe peace is possible? Yeah. Well, thank you. A lot of you raised your hand, some didn't. And I've been in places where most didn't. Um, and if we're working for peace and if we have people amongst us that don't believe peace is possible, and if you don't believe it yourself, then why would anybody join with us? And um, I think if we look at our own, and I think this is what Joy is speaking to in many ways, how much have we created a space where it looks like it's possible, right? So when you're dealing with, and I'll say this as a, a black man in the United States of America, um, all the issues that black people face, in particular, let's talk about something really violent, which is um, police brutality, right? So we're dealing with that. Am I gonna believe peace is possible? You know, when my community doesn't have enough food or whatever it is that my community is facing here at home, why am I going to believe that when it comes to fighting wars abroad, that peace is possible? So I think a big thing, even if just interpersonal relationships or what you were speaking about, how you were shut down, that happens all over the place. It's not just a Veterans for Peace issue. It happens across the board on the left. We have got to learn how to build community. And one of the reasons I'm really excited about working for uh, the South Seattle Emerald it's because that's one of the things we talk about, and the paper itself is participating in building community. And the more that we can do that in the South End, which is the most diverse area in this region, maybe all Washington, then we're creating a model for other places to be able to build community. And that is really the answer as far as I'm concerned. And let me just say one other thing, because something earlier came up about, about capitalism. I just want to say what I think about that. I think capitalism is, a, is the latest animation of imperialism. But there was imperialism long before it was capitalism. So getting rid of capitalism doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of imperialism. Because whatever it is that actually is and creates imperialism, we'll use whatever that next system is unless we're addressing whatever that thing is. I believe it's patriarchy. Maybe it's not. It damn sure plays some kind of role in it, though. I know that for sure. So if we're not addressing, to me, patriarchy in a very, very deep way, and I'm speaking to the men more than I am anybody else, but don't women don't get fooled, right? Um, then we're not going to change things. We're simply not. And everything that's happening in the world when it comes to war, I want you to look at who's leading it. Okay? All the institutions that have been created, who are the philosophical foundations who created these institutions and these ideas. Women haven't had a chance. I mean, they've been part of things. It's just not written in the history, right? I mean, definitely, always. Um, but you haven't had a chance to actually impact things in the way that you are now until like the last 200, 300 years. And this has been going on for thousands of years. So, so I guess what I'm saying is we got to dig deeper as we build community and not let ideology determine how we build community. Because if it does, then we can't build it. Anyway, so that's my little. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to say on that is peace possible question. Yes, ma'am. That peace is a constant struggle. I don't. I don't believe permanent peace is possible amongst the human race. But we can get temporary peace over and over and over again if we keep fighting for it. And I think that's a difference in saying you know we're somehow going to transform. Okay. I, I think that A.J. Mosty put, put it really good when he said, he said, uh, uh, peace is not the answer, peace is the way. And that's a, kind of a Zen thing to me, but mm -hmm. I mean, you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about utopia. 
and it's not, let's not get the two confused, right? I wanted to interject right quick that um, <clears throat> when we were talking about um, some of the statements that VOP generates um, earlier this year, <laughs> one of the one of my friends, one of my younger friends at VFP is like, "You're the lady who threw the brick." I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the 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 national board meeting after. Uh, the weekend immediately after Roe was dismantled. And the first 20 minutes of VFP National is dedicated to town hall, so if you've got something to say, you get it in there first thing. And I said that I expected VFP to respond because reproductive health and the denial thereof is not just a women's issue. Um, it's like we're looking at a, a, a military that wants to implement the draft for young women. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But my question is, if you're a young female, why in the hell would you want to serve a country that cannot guarantee your basic constitutional rights <coughs> to your own autonomy <coughs> as a human being? If you're a person of color, why the hell do you want to prop up this imperialist government? It just makes no sense. So people need to come together as a community and realize that these are not just, you know, issues that affect certain populations, but it affects us all. I'm actually running for the board of VFP National, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> why the hell not? Um, my goal is to create change. I might not see that change implemented in my life, but I want Veterans for Peace to be more representative of who the veterans today are. They're browner than me. They're queerer than I am. Uh, they're younger than me, obviously. But I want it to be representative of the people who are currently serving the military. I want them to have the voice and, and to be able to influence policy. Um, <clears throat> A lot of the, the work that gets done at VFP National at the office, there's a male executive director, but uh, there was uh, one non-binary person, but they just resigned recently. But the work of what goes on at VFP, guess who does it? <coughs> Ladies. Okay. It's really difficult being in a, a community and assuming that if I go to a meeting that I'm somebody's girlfriend. Um, rather than, you know, the girl with the gun. Um, and so it's really important that we think about the future of VFP and basing it on the future of who's participating right now, who, who are, who's fighting these wars. And um, I just want us to be always cognizant um, that because the draft ended, that doesn't mean that we're off the hook. And peace is a process, and it's never, I mean, we're at a, a point now where it's, it's critical, um, it's past critical. There, there's all of these intersections, like peace is possible, militarism is connected to climate action, right? Because the biggest <coughs> polluter in the world is the United States military. 40% of the carbon dioxide generated. I can recycle my butt off for the rest of my life and drive my little Prius. <laughs> makes me feel good, <laughs> but it's not doing a thing. Because as long as the US military is not held accountable by the Paris or the Kyoto Environmental Accords and keeps burning uh, Willie Pete and DU in the desert or just Dick Cheney just orders up a bunch of shit and just burns it in the desert just to make money. Yeah. Let me see if, anybody, if there are any other Questions. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just want to say, I just want to say that it's not done. Please, I know that it's hard work. And and the thing is that seeing when you come up here and you tell us your story, uh, that you inspire us to keep going. Sorry. I'll cut myself off right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, you know, just, just a comment because uh, I see this. In, I went over and saw the.
other people who were committed to violence, committed to enlisting in violence. And, and you know, it just, I'm not quite sure the point I'm making is, is you raised a very profound question, is peace possible? I guess I just rephrase it is, you know, can we live in a world where we're not subject to being a press gang one way or another into to doing this? No, thank you. I appreciate that. No, no, this, it was fine. I think this is a good question. It's a good question. Let me get this one here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not to go on on my theme, but I, I would urge people, if you haven't, check out Marxism, basic Marxism. Uh -huh. um, when I pointed to capitalism, that was just because it's the highest form of private property, the most developed form so far. Private property created patriarchy way back when. It was not always there. Mm -hmm. Women had a high position in the earlier societies, mm -hmm. just saying. Um, and that's why I raised my hand that I believe peace is possible, because of course there will always be conflict between right. people. But I think we can end organized slaughter uh, of groups of people by getting rid of profit. And, you know, if we all own everything and share it, however much there is, democratically, run it democratically, you know, it's not only a good idea, it's the only way we're going to survive. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, I think I just wanted to appreciate this panel for, you know, the level of struggle that you're bringing to the current movement. Um, uh, it's very important that we tackle urgent questions like the ones that were raised um, throughout the course of the day. And I think that is a pressing question on the table is what is the future of the anti-war movement, um, right? Because, you know, some of us... We never know who will still be here in 20 years, to be real. But we know that the U.S. military will still be here and will still be assaulting the majority of the people around the world for profit, right? So um, I appreciate the level of struggle, and I also appreciate the direction of uh, unity and questions. So my question for the panel um, was around issues. Um, I know issues have been framed different ways today, or campaigns. Um, what are some of the campaign fights that you think can help us to unite more and more people um, against the war machine. Um, yeah, so that's really my question for... Well, let me, I can give a partial answer to that, and I think that the future of activism in this country is probably going to be led by women. It's already that, <laughs> that way now. And I use it as an example of, uh, I haven't done counter-recruiting for a while, but when I was in the schools, this was a couple of years ago, we were talking to these young young women, you know, 16, 17 year old girls really, and uh, about the issues of militarism, give them the IQ test and something like that, and they, they get it right away, they get it. The boys are brain dead because they're adolescent boys, you know, and they can't help that, I mean, that's a kind of a problem, but these young, young women do, and, uh, you know, I, I have these great interactions with them and conversations, and they understand that, like being in the military, why? Why are over a third of the women that go into the military being assaulted, sexually assaulted? Why, why does the country let, the, uh, let, let that happen? They understand that. And I think that because of that sort of intuitive uh, awareness, that, I mean, it's a, it's a good example and, and uh, something that, that those experiences let me uh, come, come away feeling a lot more optimistic about the so-called younger generation, particularly the younger gen the female generation. Um, yeah, so I think that there are a lot of different intersections that we can see very clearly now within all of our struggles. Um, the anti-war movement is the anti-patriarchy movement, is the anti-corporatism movement. Um, and I think when I... When I think about the ways that we can be working together, 
First of all, I think there's there's a there's a real for some for a lot of reasons I guess urge to like create generational divides or to like exacerbate them rather than um, seeing us all as you know cumulative parts of the same uh, struggle. Um, I know that there is. I, th I think that the one of the ways that we can bring peace about, at least within our communities, is by creating spaces for people to feel safe and protected and secure and um, and purposeful. And um, that isn't necessarily always going to take the form of a demonstration. Sometimes it'll take the form of um, cooking meals or providing childcare while somebody goes to school, um, or through, you know, creating a safe space for someone to go to when their home environment isn't all right. Because that's kind of that's how the military sucks people up is by taking advantage of their vulnerability. So what can we do? Is you know, step in first and and say you know, that and that's why the um, the military is so effective. They come in and they say, well, let us meet these needs for you that the government is intentionally not meeting, right? Like every other developed nation, you know, in in the world has universal health care and education at this point. We don't. And it's because it's used. They've said it out in the media now. Like, oh, well, if we forgive student loans, then how are people going to, why would people join the military? Well, they actually exactly. They, live, they said it out. They they're not being secretive anymore. So it's like, we, we need to just, um, you know, I know the Poor People's Campaign is doing a lot of work, and that's important. I think it's, it's important that we see this as a class war. Um, and, you know, I think we need to be having public guillotine building workshops personally. I just say that. I know we're recording. I don't give a fuck. We need to start building guillotines as public art installations and leaving them out. Like, seriously, because it's not going to... This is like we need to be there for each other and keep each other safe, but we also need to recommend that this or recognize that this system is actively attacking us all the time by taking it by refusing to give us proper health care, proper food, proper water, by taking advantage of already marginalized communities. You know, we we need to take our comfort zones that we've got and expand them so that everybody has a comfort zone, um, and I think that is. To me, the most like possibly effective way to keep people out of the military is give them no fucking reason to need it. Uh, I'm gonna say something right quick. Okay. The super important part. It's five o'clock and there's food. Uh. <laughs> and there's copious amounts of food because we over ordered, but that's okay because I'm hungry. I don't know about the All rest right. of you. Yeah. But before we finish, I just want you to know right next door there's food, food, lots of amazing food from uh, Peace Trees, uh, Vietnam. And um, eat their food, plant a tree. <laughs> um, I'll give it back. Well, let me get this one gentleman here who had his hand up, and that would be the last question. Oh, well, now I'm going to ask you a good question. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 go no, ask, ask. ask. Your I, something that was mentioned really early on was kind of an erasure of these people uh, throughout the process, by obviously by the U.S. government, um, that was recognized that the, the Vietnamese as the primary agents in winning and like preventing ending the war. Right. Ending the war. Yeah, and GI is actively resisting to raise the barrier, the cost uh, of entry and continuation. Uh, I'm wondering if, like, to what degree, you know, periodicals, news, media were amplifying Vietnamese uh, media, and to what degree soldiers, GIs actively resisting or coordinating and uplifting uh, the Vietnamese struggle for self determination, for national sovereignty, and where we can. Like understand where there could have been more, or to what degree we can criticize uh, that uh, effort as lacking, and, and be stronger in the future. 
I'll just say as far as the media, they're not, they're definitely not talking about the Vietnamese uplifting them and their struggle and saying that they are responsible for the war. Us US losing, that's for sure. Well I saw a copy in the in the in on Tuesday I saw a red a uh, clipping from one of the GI periodicals uh, after Ho Chi Minh died talking about the struggle. Um, here in the US? One of the one of the GI uh, news publications in the exhibit oh. on Tuesday. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the mainstream media as well. Oh, yeah, sorry. My question was about uh, our own media and our okay. own press. It was okay. we are uplifting the fights for national sovereignty right. and self-determination uh, in that war and in future wars. Current wars. I mean, the, the, the media... Yeah, our media. Our media. Our media, yeah. I mean, our media doesn't even really cover our own resistance that much. I mean, but I, I, don't, I don't think that, I mean, we have corporate media here, and it's independent media that would be uplifting voices of anybody who's not here. Um, I think that is mostly happening through, you know, social media more than mainstream media at yeah. this point. And when he says our media, you mean resistance media, right? You I'm mean talking, independent media? Yeah, I'm talking about uh, the GI periodical, right. the recognition that the state and the corporations presenting media aren't going to give us the truth mm -hmm. narrative right. and the desire for ourselves to like kill the movement through. Like what I'm, I'm hearing about today and about the ways that we rejected the conventional narrative, to what degree was our own media, uh, up, so it was definitely uplifting in like telling the military that the military opposes right. the war. That was really profound. To what degree was that media amplifying the perspective you know, of the Vietnamese? <coughs> um, there was a great, I, I'll just say this, and this is about the movement back then, you know, is that there was a big split in the movement. There were people who, for instance, didn't believe that the Vietnamese should fight because they were pacifists. And they said, since I'm a pacifist, I think that the Vietnamese should be pacifists and they should use nonviolent means to try and make the Americans go away. And that's, you know, that was, that was part of the movement. You know? and, and other people in the same movement uh, who, uh, who argued, well, the Vietnamese, that's their country, and we're messing around with them, and they got the right to kick us out. And, uh, and, just, and you know, I happen to fall out in that second category that it's awfully easy for the armchair activist to, to tell somebody whose family is being slaughtered and raped and tortured and ugly, every other thing, to, uh, to some, uh, how they're going to choose to resist. I think that, uh, so our, our media, that is to say the anti-war media or the movement media back then, was in fact vital. And, you know, I think that's an interesting conversation to have about, about that because you know, do you, you know, how does that play out? And that'll always play out. We're always going to have those kind of debates, I think, about, uh, about, um, you know, do people have the right to decide how they're going to fight back? You know, well, yeah, I guess they do. If they, if they didn't have to fight back, that'd be 18, you know? Yeah, you know, Randy, that, that may be true for some of the media, but the, the uh, GI veteran uh, anti-war media was very clear in saying that we have no right in being there and the Vietnamese have a right to defend themselves. That was very clear. I don't know, I mean, I've been around as long as, as long as you have, perhaps different perspective, but it was always clear. And the Vietnamese demonstrated what they wanted, and that they, that, they just demonstrated that by kicking us out of there. You know, it's a moot point. Right. Then and now. Yeah. Okay. The Iraqis, too. Really. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the Iraqis, too, really. Like, we didn't leave Iraq until it became no longer no. Um, yeah. feasible financially to stay there because they resisted. <laughs> yeah, the U.S. doesn't leave any place until we are kicked out. That's, yeah. that's basically yeah. what has to happen. Yeah. We, don't leave. we stay forever. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you staying over. And uh, let's go eat.